and Alicia. Um, let's see, looks like the recording is in progress. So welcome everyone. Today um, I'm going to go through a quick overview of BALSA and then we're going to talk about the conformance test suite. So first and foremost, I'm going to talk about what a unit of conformance is and sort of its boundaries and why it's important to understand what a unit of conformance is when we're talking about things like BALSA and the conformance test suite. So it's a little bit of information I like to go over because after all, that is the cornerstone of the software development efforts regarding the phase technical standard. So once we talk about what a unit of conformance is, I'm going to talk about BALSA. I'm going to talk about what it is, what it can be used for, how it's organized, and then it's just some additional information regarding it. I'm going to show a couple of uh, diagrams uh, just to kind of show why it is the way it is. And then after we take a short break, I'm going to talk about the conformance test suite. I'm going to go over the testing methodology and the approach to testing with the conformance test suite. We're going to talk about uh, project configurations, tool chains, and then preparing a UOC for test, running a test, and then I will actually demo it in real time, show you using a BALSA UOC, the uh, test being executed. So unit of conformance or UOC, uh, it's mentioned a lot in the phase technical standard. A lot of people hear it thrown around, but basically it's a software component built according to the requirements in the phase technical standard. That's pretty much it. If, if you've defined, a, uh, defined and developed a software product aligned to the standard, it at its lowest level is a unit of conformance. The unit of conformance requirements can be found in section 4.11 of phase technical standard edition 3.1. I believe it's 3.11 and 3.0 because we iterated the um, chapters to introduce a definitions chapter in edition 3.1. And then segment specific UOC requirements can be found in the following sections for all of the uh, segments. But at the lowest level, there is the unit of conformance requirements. And then depending on what segment your UOC targets, you have segment specific requirements that a UOC must adhere to. So that's these. Just wanted to kind of show this. Um, for familiarization and to so that everyone understands exactly what is meant by a UOC and how you're meant to navigate the standard when building one. So a UOC is essentially, de depending on the programming language you use and its state is essentially an object, a service, or a package um, in terms of object-oriented languages, it's going to be an object and more procedural. Languages like C, it's typically going to be a service. It can be a package consisting of several services, and it can actually be deployed as a UOC package in which uh, multiple capabilities are deployed with it. A UOC may only use the interfaces defined by the face reference architecture. So for data movement, you know, the TS interface, for input output, the IO service, and for um, using OS specific um, methods and functions, the OSS APIs. And it's important to note that the UOC itself is not a standalone executable. Parts of the face technical standard do go over, you know, the concept of the external client, which is expected to produce a main and that kind of fits more into the more object-oriented approach that was introduced in 3.x. Now, with unit of, units of conformance with P, PSSS and PCS UOCs, because they interact with the TS interface and actually move data, you know, in, in and out of itself, those particular UOCs must provide a data model to model its message uh, syntax and semantics. And this is going to be in the form of a UOP supplied model defined according to the phase data architecture. Um, 
TSS, IOSS, and OSS UOCs also have to provide implementations of the face interfaces that they um, that serve as entry points to the services they provide. And what this means is that when it comes to the face technical standard, a UOC is both a provider and a user of a face interface. And if you look at this um, diagram at the bottom, you have just a, a very basic mock-up of a UOC using a TSS interface and then a UOC that provides the TSS interface, you know, kind of within that UOC boundary. And so on the left, the TSS implementation would provide the TSS interface, whereas a PSSS or PCS UOC would use that interface. So it's very important to understand that concept. And of course, because the UOC on the right is going to use the TS interface, all its data exchanges have to be modeled in accordance with the face data architecture and supply a UOP supplied model when it comes to conformance. So now let's get into BALSA now that we know what a UOC is and kind of its boundaries and, you know, kind of the, the reason for the madness. So BALSA or basic avionics lightweight source archetype, just because everyone loves an acronym. Um, it's a set of UOCs that provides the following. First and foremost, a face computing environment, which is basically an instantiation of the face reference architecture. A face computing environment provides the minimal UOCs in certain segments in order to integrate new PSSS and PCS capabilities. So the face computing environment provided by BALSA has TSS UOCs, it has IOSS UOCs, an implementation of the OSS configuration services, it has an HMFM service implementation, it has a centralized logging PSSS UOC, um, it supplies the FACE interfaces defined by the FACE technical standard, and it also provides implementations of the FACE support classes. And these are defined in appendices of the FACE technical standard, include things like uh, fixed, string, and sequence. And then also, in addition to the FACE computing, computing environment, it provides a set of PSSS UOCs that use the FACE computing environment in order to demonstrate a, a very basic avionics process. I believe there's I think four uh, PSSS and PCS UOCs, other than the centralized logging, of course, that um, basically combine position and uh, tail number data to, you know, kind of, you know, show an ADSB out process. And it's got a, a mock PSSS. Um, when I say mock, it's that it, because it doesn't um, fulfill all of the requirements of a UOC in the PSSS. But we call it the ADSBN, and basically it's just to read back in the data going out over the wire and show that full loop. So um, I do I do have to um, acknowledge that when it comes to BALSA, there is one um, mock PSSS UOC that's just there for demonstration purposes. It does not fulfill the requirements of a true PSSS UOC. Here's the uh, face boundary diagram for BALSA. At the very top in the portable component segment, we have a PCS called the ATC Manager, and it communicates with the uh, BALSA TSS. The BALSA TSS is con uh, consists of a TSTA adapter UOC, which provides the TS capability. It also features a type abstraction UOC that provides the abstraction capability, distribution, and configuration. The uh, platform specific services segment has four platform device services. The uh, EGI controller, the aircraft config, the ADSB out, and then even though it doesn't so, um, satisfy all of the PSSS requirements, we do include the ADSB in on the diagram just to kind of show it. And then for platform device services within the PSSS, we have a centralized logging UOC. At the IO services segment, we have a, a implementation of the generic IO service. And it provides uh, UDP um, uh, read and write capabilities that communicate with the Ethernet device driver. And also there is an implementation of the generic IO service that just does file input output. And that is used by the centralized logging UOC to actually write out its data. At the OSS, the operating system that is assumed is Linux or um, some form of the Linux kernel. 
the config, there is a configuration services ULC provided by Balsa, which I mentioned on the previous slide, and there is a health monitoring implementation. Um, it's uh, one, for those of you that are um, not so familiar with the health monitoring. There is two ways it can be implemented. Either one um, in a POSIX pure environment using the health monitoring um, uh, C style uh, declaration that's in the face technical standard. However, if you're using A rank 653, you are um, required to use the health monitoring APIs that are provided by A rank. And if you are providing a mix of POSIX and A rank for your POSIX processes, you are expected to implement the health monitoring API as sort of a wrapper to the A rank 653 methods. So that's the boundary diagram. Now, as far as kind of more specifically what BALSA is and why it is the way it is, it's, it's written in C++ with some C services. It uses the POSIX safety base API set. It was developed using CentOS 7. However, we've tested it on other operating systems, um, CentOS 8, um, I think Lynx OS, and a couple of RTOSs. I can't remember which ones other than DOS RTEMS. It uses a multiple inheritance pattern um, to inherit and implement the face interfaces at, at different levels of inheritance. It uses uh, base classes and it also implements the factory pattern in its design, especially when creating new connections in the TSS and in the IOSS as well. So the factory pattern has, has proven very useful in um, ab abstracting different services at different levels and for uh, providing better extensibility and reuse. We originally used the J, uh, Joint Strike Fighter coding standard. Um, I, I say originally used because it's had so many iterations along the way that I'm not 100% confident that we are 100% compliant with that coding standard. However, we originally did write our code according to that style. So, yeah, that, that was uh, just something we chose. And it, we also implement a very strict set of compiler settings. We use uh, pedantic and we use uh, all warnings as errors to ensure that it compiles as clean as possible. We also provide shell scripts for launch operations. You can launch it as one UOC per executable or you can launch them as a group with the ADSB in being outside of the um, one executable that instantiates and um, manages the life cycle of the rest of the UOCs. And just for <clears throat> information, all UOCs do pass the phase conformance test suite. Um, however, they only, um, there, there is a certain test suite that we last tested with. There are two new versions of the CTS per 3.0 and 3.1, and we haven't fully tested it with those because we delivered BALSA to the FACE consortium before those CTSs came out. So what is it used for? As far as the consortium, the consortium gets a lot of use when it comes to BALSA in the form of vetting CR content and testing changes. It proves to be a very valuable test bed. Now for government and industry partners, it can be used for developing new products, learning about the face reference architecture, and kind of understanding, you know, patterns and, you know, an approach to developing face UOCs. Because, you know, a lot of people tend to learn by doing. I, I know I'm 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 one of them. I like to see a pattern implemented before I, you know, can you know can safely say that I understand it. And then also it's useful as a test infrastructure. It's it's out there for use by companies and government as sort of you know, a way to have a test infrastructure. That way you don't have to go out and procure your own, procure or build your own TSS or IOSS. For, for, for example, it's, it's there for that use. Because after all, in face, you're designing to interfaces, not to implementations. So there's benefit in that. Now, how we organized it. So being that it's in C++, we have the ability of separating things by namespace. The only thing that's in the face namespace is the is the are the interfaces and 
things defined by the face technical standard. So we implement nothing in the face namespace. We just use it for the headers and the implementations of the support classes, simply because um, most of the support classes are in class form. And so um, hands are just kind of tied there. But uh, as far as the face support classes and their implementation, these are considered integrator provided aspects. Um, some OSSs do provide them. Um, and certain uh, products that you can procure have them as well. So, in order to not overload the face namespace, we created <clears throat> yet another acronym, <laughs> FIA or face implementation architecture. And that's where we've implemented all of our face interfaces as far as the um, TSS, IOSS, and OSS UOCs. Uh, we also create component base classes in the FIA namespace. And then in the Balsa namespace, we have our application specific adapter services for things like the TSS and IOSS. We have our TSTA infrastructure. We also have the Balsa component classes and PCS and PSSS base classes. Now, once again, each of these um, base component classes inherit interfaces at, at different levels. For instance, at the component base class, all components are assumed to use the configuration services, so they inherit the configura configuration injectable interface. And then, you know, more specifically at the PCS and PSSS levels, um, they inherit the TSS base, and then. PCS and PSSS, you will see classes in themselves where you get into actual instantiations of specific services. Then you inherit your type TS injectables. And also we have external clients, which provide main. They instantiate the UOCs, they resolve the UOC dependencies via the lifecycle, uh, no, I'm sorry, the injectable interfaces. And then they also manage the UOC lifecycle. Now, one extra little tidbit about Balsa. Balsa does implement as much of the face technical standard as relatively possible. And in doing so, we have also implemented all of the lifecycle management interfaces except for the uh, framework uh, connectable interface. So we implement the initializable, configurable, and the stateful interface. Some bonus features when it comes to Balsa, uh, there is a user's guide. And it's complete with CTS instructions on how to compile and test, UOC, uh, test the Balsa UOCs with the conformance test suite. An early version of a Balsa 3.0 UOC did successfully pass face, the face verification authority. And I've, I know you can't see it, but you know, down on the right hand side, that is the statement of verification that we received back from the face VA. Um, asserting that their review was success, successful and they have, not sure what the correct term is for how it passes their level. It's not conformant yet because it hasn't been through all the levels, but it did pass phase verification. So I believe that's all I can say about that. Um, and then also as part of the source distribution of also, there is a TSS benchmarking tool called Ping Pong, where it is used to basically measure the data flow rate and latency uh, of, of TSS messages on a particular OS that you're testing it on. So that was very useful for us in kind of showing um, the TSS latency on different OSs. I know we tested it on, on both CentOS and Raspberry Pi. Not sure if it's been tested on any other OSs. And then another bonus, Balsa has been successfully deployed on a face conformant RTOS. So it is portable to a uh, RTOS with slight modification. Now, going back to talking about inheritance, this is kind of a bit of an eye chart, I, I, I'm aware, <laughs> but this is a, a UML class diagram showing the inheritance at different levels in Balsa components. Now, this does not include an example of a um, of a PCS or PSSS that provides a service. This is uh, strictly the base class architecture. At the lowest level, kind of in the middle, the biggest one, the FIA component inherits the configuration injectable. It also inherits the LCM initializable and configurable. Going down one more step to the Balsa component, it inherits the Lifecycle management component st uh, 
stateful stateful instance, sorry, um, simply because the stateful interface is tied to a data model. So it's a little bit less abstract, which is why we grouped it in the BALSA namespace because it's specific to the BALSA data model. And then at the PCS and PSSS level is when you inherit your base injectable. So this is sort of the inheritance structure that we used. And once again, at the actual service level of the PCS and PSSS classes is when you inherit your type TS injectables. How it looks when it's running, this is kind of a, a mock example of what BALSA looks like when you run it with one UOC per executable. It basically just creates a bunch of uh, terminals and prints out the data that's, you know, that it's processing. And if everything works, the ADSBN, which you can see on, on top, on the left, um, on the right is the centralized logging component, which, you know, just prints out like a, like a, a message or two. And then it just kind of just waits in the background. Uh, the ADSBN is showing everything that it's got, and if you have correctly implemented everything, then it will be getting ADSB data, which you can see displayed on that console window. Okay, that's it for the BALSA portion.